Hey, aloha and welcome to Stan the Energy Man. Stan Osterman here from Tiger Shark Energy Consulting H2. It's my little LLC. So, semi donations. I haven't made any money yet. Anyway, I was getting ready for today's show and I was inspired by a lot of folks who actually, one of my hydrogen safety shows has almost 50,000 hits on it. So, I thought I'd kind of review some of the stuff because a lot has changed, a lot is up to date. So I was looking through some of my videos and <clears throat> I actually found one that was done before I even started working for the state, which was 2013. And it was when the video was done back in probably 2006-ish, 2005, 2006. Governor Lingle's in the video, Senator Akaka's in the video. Um, the active duty wing commander, J.J. Torres, is in the video. And it's all about the hydrogen vehicles who are making at Hickam. And what really caught my attention was how much they were talking about carbon, CO2, greenhouse gases, climate change. This is 15 years ago. You know how far we moved the needle on almost any of the energy stuff that we talked about 15 years ago? Almost not at all. So other than our new energy goal of being off of uh, fossil fuels for the grid by 2045, it's, it's scary to look back 15 years and think how much or how little we've actually done. But anyway, I want to talk a little bit more about hydrogen today because um, for me, hydrogen is the answer. And I'm not sure people really understand why. So here's a few things that, about hydrogen that I think you'd, you'd kind of like to know. Most folks understand that hydrogen is the very first element on the periodic chart, but it's also the most common element in the universe. Not just this planet, but the entire universe. But here's the catch. As an atomic particle, it's attracted to almost everything. So you can't find hydrogen all by itself, like you can other elements like iron or oxygen or gold. But you will find that hydrogen is common in things that need energy. Did you ever wonder why water is so important to life? Think about it. Water is the most essential element on Earth. When you ask scientists about the potential for life on other planets, the first thing they do is look for water. And wouldn't you know it, water is only made up of two different atoms, hydrogen and oxygen. So not only is hydrogen in water, but it makes up two-thirds of the atomic composition of water. And wouldn't it be amazing if it turned out that water could be just as useful as gasoline in moving your car or truck or even a big train or an airplane? Well, amazingly enough, it's entirely possible. And surprisingly, the technology is not brand new. It's over a century old. And it's also interesting that two-thirds of the atoms that make up water are often accused of being dangerously flammable. Isn't that weird? Water? Flammable? In fact, for over a century, people associated hydrogen with one of the first disasters ever captured on film or broadcast live over a radio. The disaster was the Hindenburg, and many people blame hydrogen for the disaster, but it just doesn't, it's not true. But in reality, hydrogen is very safe. In fact, professionals, the firefighters we've trained, and many others would argue that hydrogen is even safer than gasoline or jet fuel. But at the same time, it's also the favorite choice of many engineers when it comes to putting a rocket into space. Liquid hydrogen is one of the key components of rocket fuel. It would also come as some surprise to many that oxygen, that friendly element that we so, re we so require with every breath, is one of the most dangerous gases when in its pure state. So I think it's time that we de demystify hydrogen and we study the history books to learn, all we, all, learn about all we know already know about this marvelous element. And then look around us and see all of the amazing things that have been developed around hydrogen technology, particularly in the last 20 years. Let's start by asking the question. We already have oil and gas and coal, and, and we know how to use them well. So why should we change? Not only do we have plenty of those things, but they're also inexpensive. Well, many people today are obviously concerned with greenhouse gases and climate change and burning these, these transportation fuels and, power, and using it for power in our homes and our industries with electricity made from carbon-based fuels like oil and coal just don't seem to make sense from an environmental perspective. 
Even natural gas, which is much better for the environment when it's burned other than, rather than coal or oil, is still carbon-based and releases greenhouse gases. So let's start there. Many power companies still burn fossil fuels to make electricity, and unfortunately not many states have the rivers and topography to have big hydroelectric dams. And even relatively clean nuclear power comes with a lot of baggage. Particularly, what do you do with the spent fuel, which can cause serious environmental and health concerns for many, many centuries? Obviously, we should be able to do better in generating power, particularly with all of the solar and wind that's available to convert to power. But the grid and heavy industry only account for about half of the greenhouse gases, and particulate matter that come from burning fossil fuels. Transportation is the other culprit. So wouldn't it be nice if there was a common solution to clean up our grid, our industry, and even our transportation sector? I'd like to propose that hydrogen is the alternative for the grid, is an alternative for the grid, and for the transportation sector. They're kind of symbiotic. So for starters, let's talk about transportation and its automobile origins. When we stopped using animals to pull us around in carts or on their backs, and the automobile came about, most of the best automobile designs used electricity and motors for their drivetrains. Many people are actually astonished that the very first Porsche made in Germany was an electric vehicle. So why is it that we don't all drive electric vehicles today, if electric drive is so much better? We're all driving gasoline and diesel vehicles. Why? And the answer is simple. It's all about energy storage. Back when cars were first being developed, battery technology was in its infancy, and the batteries at the time were heavy and could not store a lot of energy. But the emerging internal combustion engine industry used fuel that could give a, a new automobile the range that everyone desired. And as they say, the rest is history. So interestingly enough, in spite of the incredible progress we've made with battery technology, batteries are still limited, and vehicles, by the way, require a lot of energy. Just for example, my house would require as much energy as to drive my car 30 miles in one day. So that, that's about the energy equivalence. So not only that, but in spite of all our marvelous batteries on the market today, they're all handicapped by weight and cost. So wouldn't it be interesting if there was an electric vehicle that had a self-charging battery? A battery that you didn't have to stop and plug into an outlet for several hours or batteries that weighed thousands of pounds. And you are moving around those things with you at that cost of moving that heavy weight. Aviators realize that when it comes to transportation, it's all about weight. So whether it's cars or buses or trucks or airplanes, the more weight you carry, the more energy you spend carrying your fuel. So let's get back to hydrogen. Hydrogen can be made, or you might even say refined, because it's just attached to everything else, from many common elements, including methane, natural gas, oil, and yes, even water. And the cleanest hydrogen comes from water. For many years, the problem with making hydrogen from water was that it required a large amount of electricity. So it didn't make a lot of sense to make hydrogen when gasoline and diesel were a fraction of the cost. But an interesting thing is happening around the world. We've discovered inexpensive ways to harness solar energy and wind energy on our grids and turn it into electricity. And that's a really good piece of news for customers of electricity, but it's really bad news for the electric utility because wind and solar power are not consistent like turbines and hydroelectric dams. The sun doesn't shine all day long and the clouds come and go and the wind changes direction constantly. So the utilities have a hard time balancing their electric grid when the power is coming from all these little intermittent renewable sources, whether they're big fields or just your rooftop. And the energy is constantly fluctuating while the demand for power on the customer side is also constantly fluctuating. The power from the generators and hydroelectric dams is called firm power and the power from solar arrays and wind is called intermittent power. So how do you take all of that intermittent power that we plan to produce and uh, turn it into firm power for the grid? And the answer, surprisingly, is also the answer to making clean, inexpensive hydrogen. It's, it's turning it into, into hydrogen with an electrolyzer. Because you see, the electrolyzer that makes hydrogen and oxygen from water can handle the fluctuations in the power easier than the grid. 
So all of that intermittent power that the utility would normally have to throw away, the official term is called curtailing, by the way, can now be used to make something good for transportation. But wait, there's more. That hydrogen can be stored at a scale, huge scale, for a long period of time. And it doesn't deteriorate, it can deteriorate like in batteries. And then it can be used to put electricity back on the grid. And that large-scale hydrogen storage is far cheaper than battery storage. So that's why um, I think hydrogen is such an elegant solution for many of today's problems, environmental problems especially. So let's talk about hydrogen a little bit and demystify this wonderful element. So as we said before, hydrogen is the most common element in the universe. We just have to extract it from other molecules. And one of those molecules being water, which happens to fill our oceans, by the way, and there's big oceans. And they really are, the really neat thing about hydrogen coming from water is that hydrogen, when you use it in, a, in a equipment to make electricity, you get back some of the water. In fact, you get back quite a bit of the water. And while you're making hydrogen, you're also making pure oxygen, which can be used in hospitals, welding, and many other industrial applications. So there's plenty around, plenty of hydrogen. It's non-toxic. And when you use it, it turns it back into clouds. How, how good can that be? No particulates and no pollution, no carbon dioxide, no greenhouse gases. So here's some interesting facts about hydrogen. It's 14 times lighter than air. It goes up at 45 miles an hour, which is about 60 feet per second. And that's why 150 years ago, they used it in balloons to lift payloads high above the earth for transportation and for the military. But hydrogen is powerful as well. As I said earlier, one of the main reasons or main components of rocket fuel is hydrogen. And even, it even powers the stars in our galaxy. When it comes to weight, you cannot store more energy by weight than in hydrogen. For example, a typical 12-volt lead-acid battery can, can store about 50 amp hours per kilogram of weight. The typical nickel-cadmium battery can store about 165 amp hours per kilogram of weight. The most typical lithium ion technologies today can store about 500 amp hours per kilogram, which is huge. That's like 10 times more than a, a lead battery. But would you like to take a guess at how many amp hours you can get out of a kilogram of hydrogen? Not 55, not 500. The answer is a mind-blowing hydrogen will give you 26,000 amp hours per kilogram. So in the transportation world, hydrogen should be king. Because remember I said earlier that weight in transportation is everything. It costs you money to move a lot of weight. So you shouldn't be moving heavy fuel if you can use a lighter fuel. That's why the engineers use hydrogen for rocket fuel. You can't get more energy by weight than with hydrogen. And when you mix hydrogen with oxygen, you get a great combustion. The big bonus is your exhaust is only heat and water vapor. But when people read about hydrogen, there's a lot of disturbing questions that come up. And one question is, but hydrogen's explosive, and the flame is invisible, so you can walk right into it and, and be burned to death and not even know it was there. So when I get those kind of questions or comments, I know I'm engaged with someone who just doesn't know a whole lot about hydrogen from a practical standpoint. Yes, hydrogen will burn, but only when it's mixed with oxygen or air, which is air is actually only about 20% oxygen, mostly nitrogen. But the reality is that it's very hard to get hydrogen and oxygen to mix to a flammable or explosive ratio unless you confine it and give it time to blend, to homogenize. The hydrogen that we produce for vehicles is pure hydrogen, and it's not flammable at all when it's stored in a tank. And the tanks themselves are strong and have safety valves in their design. And in fact, the Army is starting to look at hydrogen for some of their transportation in combat because it's much quieter, doesn't emit any smoke, has a lower heat signature, which is important for thermal imaging, and an internal combustion vehicle can't even compare on the heat side. And they're concerned about hydrogen volatility, of course, so they went to the range and they set up some fully pressurized hydrogen tanks with high power and shot at them with high-powered rifles. The basic bullet just ricocheted off and, the, and ricocheted off the tanks because they were so tough. The armor-piercing bullets went right through the tanks and made a clean hole in and a clean hole out, and the gas escaped through both holes, but there was no fire. 
Then they shot at the armor piercing, then they shot armor piercing, high explosive rounds, thinking that that would make the tanks blow up. But what happened is the bullet went, made a clean entry, like on the first, second one, and a clean exit. But then the hydrogen it was escaping was mixed enough with oxygen once it got outside to catch on fire. So a blowtorch like um, uh, flame came out of the tanks. And after 10 minutes, the hydrogen burned off and the tank was still sitting there pretty much intact with two holes in it and no explosion. Obviously, that wasn't good enough for the Army, so they also attacked the hydrogen tank with a rocket-propelled grenade and some plastic explosives. Needless to say, they did some serious damage to the tank, but it was hard to tell whether it was hydrogen damage or whether it was explosive damage from the explosives. So the Army concluded that hydrogen was pretty darn safe. What I'd like to do now is actually show you a quick video, and then we'll come back and talk a little bit about hydrogen to wrap up the show. On this is why I built it. I, I wanted to make a hydrogen stove, first of all, but we also built it to help train first responders. So <clears throat> I used to go with the California Fuel Cell Partnership and the New York Fi the City Fire Department and go to different fire stations all around the islands here, to the firehouses, and teach the guys, preparing them for fuel cell EVs, the facts about hydrogen and dispelling all the myths and misinformation, right? So there's basically, first of all, hydrogen is the most ab abundant element in the universe. Everybody knows that. It's one on the periodic table. It's the lightest and smallest as well. It's 14 times lighter than air, twice as light as helium. So it goes up at 45 miles per hour. That's 66 feet a second. So if you went 1,001, it's six stories a day in a second. Wow. It's hauling ass. It's hard to keep it around. So the buoyancy is one thing that makes it safer than any other flammable gas. Because hydrocarbon gases are heavier than air. They flow like water. So they stick around. Uh, so in a classroom, usually with an eight-foot acoustical ceiling, I go, right, you got a leak of hydrogen. And make sure everybody can hear it in the back. <laughs> Conventional wisdom would be if there's a spark, it would explode. Right? Well, you could see a little bit of distortion maybe right there where it was actually converting it to water vapor. <laughs> but it's moving so fast, by the time it's an inch from the hole, it's hit air molecules and scattered to it's not even combustible mixture anymore. The ratio is not there anymore. That's already left the building before I even started talking about it. It hit the ceiling and went out the vents at the top. It'll go through drywall. The stuff is really hard to contain. Right? So that makes it safer than any other flammable gas. The second thing is that you're gonna have to come in close to this because since there's no carbon in this fuel, it's pure hydrogen, like this. There's almost no radiant energy. I can put my finger, put no touch on top. top. It's over five to a thousand degrees on top. On the side. But down here, Don't touch it. You touched it. I touched it. Okay. I warned you. Because I'm a carbon-based life, life form. It likes to... It likes to jump right out and get you. Yeah. Okay. So, but, uh, interesting. to put it in perspective, this watt burner, mm -hmm. way over $200 of use. Okay. We've never repainted it. we never touched it. Okay. And it's because the lack of radiant heat, the heat goes straight up only, unless you put something in its way like a finger. <coughs> and that's cool. <laughs> so, I mean, none of this is heating up, or the paint would have been—the paint would have been oxidized, mm -hmm. you know, after yeah. ten hours of use. Mm -hmm. So, that is the second thing that if you have a leak and it ignites, it doesn't heat up everything around you. Have you ever seen the video of a gas car and a fuel cell car on fire? The difference is so dramatic. In thirty seconds, everyone in that car is burned. They're gone. The gasoline ruptured the tank. It engulfs the entire car in fuel and fire. The hydrogen is shooting a torch out the back where it leaked. So you got a six foot torch. And, and even the gasket, the rubber yeah, the, the rubber on the windshield really? doesn't melt. There's yeah. no radiant heat. There was, a, uh, there was a tanker uh, tube trailer in California that was moving hydrogen. And it was a covered one like the one you saw down at Nelha today with Mitch's thing. And it had a, sl a small leak in one of the 
second row of tanks. And apparently a spark ignited it. It blew the top of the tanker off, I mean just the, the, the sheet metal, and started a fire. So of course they evacuated a half a mile around this thing. They called in two fire trucks to put water on it and put the fire out. And it was a non-event. After the non-event, the truck still drove. Out of the 25 cylinders, 19 of them were still usable. And the only ones that weren't were above the fire where it was in the flame and that it damaged the tanks. There was a tree right on the sidewalk within five feet of the thing, didn't even scorch a leaf. And underneath the tanker, there was no damage to the pavement. Now, if you've ever seen a vehicle fire on a highway, it damages like concrete so badly, you, you can't use a bridge anymore right. if a big truck or something catches on fire. Yeah. Huge so differences. What happened with the this, right. is, this is my theory, but I'll stick to it. So, <clears throat> as you saw here, the lack of radiant heat, right? The dirigible was painted with an aluminized waterproofing compound, right? That's what they painted the fabric with to make it waterproof. <clears throat> Today we call that compound thermite, okay? In thermite lights, it burns incredibly hot and it can't be extinguished. It's impossible, it has to be consumed. <clears throat> so lightning struck the, the bladder, caught the thermite on fire, the skin started burning, Lots of radiant heat from that, I mean, an enormous amount. It ruptured the hydrogen bags inside, and a huge hydrogen fireball ensued. That fireball is what saved the people yeah. below in the gondola from being baked to death. It pulled all of the heat, including the frame and the skin and the hydrogen heat, up and away from the people, mm -hmm. giving it time to hit the ground and them to scatter. That is the most plausible explanation for what happened, right? And I mean, <clears throat> I would never have known it if it wouldn't have been for my experience with hydrogen and testing it. When I started 2012 <laughs> with this, the first time I lit this stove, I had it on a stick. With <laughs> 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 it went, <laughs> I was like, that's it? <laughs> So I started learning more and more and more and more and more. And you see how visible this flame is? Yeah. And it's a beautiful flame too. Right? That's odorless, non-toxic, blah, blah, blah. Need a signature? No? Oh, thanks, Bob. Um, so this was made with sunlight and water with energy rule to throw it away. What's the green, 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 green yellow sticks? Okay. Well, it, it's, it's burning some dust in the air, but it's mostly just hydrogen with the oxygen in the air making water vapor, right? And if you put your hand up here, you can feel the moisture in the flame. It's kind of a damp heat. So it's really nice if you barbecue, it doesn't dry your food out as much, right? Um, but it's so if you so going 24 hours, you'd have a puddle of water underneath? Uh, no, because it's making vapor and it's just going off. It's just making clouds from it. But the fact that, you know, I, I've done, I don't know how many people have come through here by now, but I had a group of food truck guys come through one time. They went nuts because they cooked themselves inside the vans when they're cooking. It's so hot and wet. They went crazy. They went, would you fill our bottles if we bought it? <laughs> so, I mean, the heat goes where you want it to. Paul Pontio from Blue Planet Research on the Big Island does that. Uh, that he does a tour inside of his lab there, and he gives that tour a couple times a month, so maybe three or four times a month. And that's one of the demonstrations I think impresses people the most. But as uh, I hope he answers some of the questions, and you know, one thing I mentioned before we went to the video was some of the questions I always get, and one of them is, isn't the flame invisible? I, Paul talked a little bit about that, but it turns out the flame is hard to see in daylight, but it's quite visible at night, and as you can tell in the video, even indoors. It's kind of bluish, and occasionally, as impurities go through from the air, it'll, it'll give off a little bit of orange color. But the notion of walking into a hydrogen flame innocently is not realistic. One of the things I did as, uh, as an example is I would, I would vent some hydrogen on my gas station to show what a pressurized tank releasing hydrogen sounds like. It's actually deafening. The gas escaping out of a small hole and burning uh, is... is Without a sound, it's like impossible. It's going to have a sound. So you can hear that like it's a torch sound, like a blowtorch. 
and it'd be very hard to walk into a hydrogen flame unnoticed. In fact, even the heat waves of the flame outside, you can, you can see them on the sidewalk. So that's, that's some of the questions I get from hydrogen. So I've got a really good video that I just showed you from Paul that he loves showing that, um, that hydrogen wok. And I think he said it in there, the, the, the wok burner um, has very little wear and tear on it. It's actually in pretty good shape because hydrogen doesn't have any carbon in it. It doesn't radiate any heat out the side. So it's, it's really, really clean. So thanks to Paul for letting us see that. So the last thing I got to say is um, about hydrogen is that most folks really just don't appreciate hydrogen for all it can do. But it's valuable on the grid because it can help stabilize the grid. But the only way that it'll help stabilize the grid is when we have a lot of intermittent renewable on board and we need to have a load during the daytime when there's too much solar and wind power to be used. So instead of having to shut down generators, you would just keep on using the electricity and make hydrogen and just keep storing the hydrogen. That hydrogen could be used for transportation or to put back in a stationary fuel cell and give you grid power back. It has to be converted, converted from AC or DC to AC power for the grid, but you could use it for both. So there's a neat relationship there if we could really get our heads around it that if you are using curtailed power to make hydrogen, it could help you with your long-term storage on the grid, and it could help with your electric transportation, because all a fuel cell does in a car is it turns hydrogen into electricity, heat, and water. And there you go. You've got the perfect system. If you make it from sunlight or wind, it's clean from beginning to end with no carbon in it. When it gets used in a fuel cell, it puts off heat, electricity, and water, and all those are good things. That's what I think we ought to be doing. And so I hope that this is a refresher for those of you that uh, know a little bit about hydrogen, or if you don't know, it's a, it'll get you thinking about what we really should be doing and how hydrogen can be a great solution in our world today as we try and use more intermittent renewables and try and clean up our environment. So that'll do it for today. We're Stan the Energy Man, and I thank you for joining me here at ThinkTech, and we'll see you next week, same time, Tuesday, 3 p.m. Hawaii time and on think on YouTube think tech on YouTube so aloha till next week